All right, without further ado, um, I'm very happy to introduce Kim Zito from New England Foundation for the Arts. She is the Program Director of Public Art at NIFA, and she's also a wonderful colleague and has been a core collaborator on this series. So, Kim. Awesome. Um, thanks, Emma. As Emma mentioned, I'm Kim Sito, Program Director for Public Art here at the New England Foundation for the Arts. And for those of you who may not be familiar with NIFA, um, NIFA is one of our six regional arts organizations across the U.S. and we work in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts, our state arts agencies here in New England, as well as private foundations to invest in artists and communities and to foster equitable access to the arts in New England and across the nation. And you can always learn more about us at our website at www.nifa.org. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Emma. This has been a great collaboration um, with MEPC as well as the team at DSRSI um, to pull together this uh, wonderful lineup of speakers. Um, and it brings me great joy to introduce our moderator today, Lori Lovenstein. Uh, Lori is one of the co-founders of the Design Studio for Social Intervention, um, along with Kenny Bailey, who you all got to hear last week, along with um, Anthony and Molly. And Lori has over 25 years of experience working um, with in youth development, as well as consulting in areas related to creative placemaking, as well as facilitation around diversity, equity, and design, as well as evaluation and documentation. Um, she's a wonderful ice cream maker, too. <laughs> um, and you can learn more about her writings, um, her recent writings on the DS4 site website. But she also recently wrote a blog um, on our website. It's called Refusing the Past, Imagining the Future, uh, that takes a look at the role of public art and spatial justice. Um, that's an area that we're particularly interested um, in here at, at NIFA on the public art team. Um, and as I mentioned last week, Lori, along with Kenny, have been dear colleagues and uh, trusted thought partners in this work. And you guys are in for a real treat today. So with that, I think I'll hand over the virtual mic to Lori to introduce our guest speakers and to lead us in this conversation about activating public spaces for creativity, connection, and celebration. Thanks, Cam. Um, if this wasn't virtual, we really would be having some good treats. Um, but Kim and I love to talk about baking cookies and making ice cream and whatnot. Um, so we'll just tease you with that. Uh, but really excited to be here virtually and to get to share a panel with uh, Karen Young and Roberto Bedoya. And as I said to some friends, you know, we're talking about creating welcoming spaces and spaces of belonging. And I don't know uh, really two more warm and welcoming panelists I could have gotten on this uh, this chance to, to talk and share ideas together. So I think y'all really enjoy them and I'll get to enjoy them a little bit more with you and introduce them after I talk a little bit about this kind of framework of spatial justice and uh, public making as a strategy for spatial justice. So I'm gonna share my screen and kind of talk through that a little bit and then give you a chance to, to hear from the panelists. Let's see here. All right, oops. Last week we introduced uh, our framework of spatial justice as a frame for reclaiming our rights to be, thrive, express, and connect. And I, uh, I wanna really think about that in this current moment um, because social injustice plays out in space. And even since our last conversation, right, just over the weekend um, with the police shootings in Kenosha, Wisconsin and Lafayette, Louisiana, I just wanna take a moment to underscore um, how critical it is that folks have the right to be, to literally be, to thrive, to express and connect in space. And so as we think about public making um, as a tool for spatial justice, and we think about this moment where you might be thinking like, how can we be doing public making like during COVID um, we can't be out there together. We can't um, we we can't see each other and sing together, or hug each other. I, I've been watching these videos of our public making, and it, it's just shocking, right? Having all these people together in space. Um, so I do want to think about in this moment how important this is, even if it looks different, and how important it is to keep in mind 
um, spatial justice as we start to imagine new ways to come together in space. Um, so we'll be talking about public making as the, what we call the collective creation and activation of public spaces for intersex interaction and belonging. This is a uh, picture from a little while ago, but so many pictures like this, right, of our communities just empty um, since, since COVID-19. And really uh, thinking about public making in this context of welcoming people in back into public spaces. And we're just starting to do that, understanding that our fears and our fears of the other um, are not neutral, right? And, and they make spaces that maybe some folks never felt welcome in even more difficult and stressful. Um, and I think of the ways that Kenny talked last week about horizontal policing and a sense of, for folks with spatial privilege, a sense of policing other people's being in space and how that's heightened in our fear of the other and our fear of COVID-19. So really thinking together about how important it is to welcome people back and rebuild a vibrant public, a place where we can collectively heal and make sense of the moment and, and problem solve and actually imagine new ways to be together that are gonna be so important for spatial justice. So I want to, to really lean into imagining a future where we are co-creating spaces to interact, to laugh, to learn, to debate, to dialogue, to surprise each other. And think about at this time where we're feeling increased isolation, tension, repression, even depression, right? What these spaces can mean and how can we be creative in creating spaces, even in this sort of hybrid time? What are we doing virtually? What are we doing together? How are we starting to rethink public spaces, take some spaces back from cars and what have you? And I wanted to think some specifically, how do we think about this? If we want to do public making that's really increasing spatial justice, what are some things um, that we want to be thinking about? As we consider spaces, whether they're our town common or our neighborhood street or our downtown, um, when we go out into space, who gets to perform the ownership of that public space and public life? Who's out there feeling like this space is for them? They get to be at the center where others might be at the margins. That has to do with culture, class, ethnicity, age, so many things, but really paying attention to that. And it plays out in some ways. What sounds get condemned? What sounds are condoned? Who gets to be loud? Who gets to play their music? Who gets to talk loud, take up space? Um, whose presence is policed and whose is celebrated? Whose is shown on posters? Whose is shown on our websites? Whose is erased? Who's in monuments, right? The things that we talked about last week. Um, how do we make sure that folks feel welcome in our spaces? And we're gonna be thinking more about our physical spaces next week, but today we're really gonna be thinking about these opportunities to really um, invite people into spaces. Um, that center picture, a beautiful image from the, the black trans uh, rally during Pride Week, that was at Franklin Park. So really creating a presence in Franklin Park and then marching down to Dudley. Um, the picture on the right, um, just thinking about how, uh, you know, those of us who misuse spaces, like myself, I let my dogs off leash, um, I get to be running a panel on spatial justice. When other folks who don't look like me, who misuse public space, are much more likely to be policed. I think about Franklin Park users who are enjoying the space and playing loud music and how differently they're treated um, than I am or this woman would be with our dogs. And again, thinking about other kinds of public spaces. You know, when we think about public making, we tend to think about being out in the streets and interacting with each other, but we have public meetings, we have public websites. Uh, we're creating new public spaces, right? You can see there in Central Square in Cambridge, right? There's ways that we're taking back the streets. But even as we do so, are we increasing spatial justice? Um, are we bringing people together? Are we making folks feel welcome, right? What actual linguistic languages are being used and what formal and informal languages, right? How are we um, really making sure we're not using the kinds of language that alienates people um, on our websites, in our meetings, um, in our public spaces. Um, and then as we think about these new spaces, uh, this nice cafe here, what spaces are getting it? I haven't seen this cafe here in Upham's Corner in Dorchester. Like, are we really making this available to all of our communities? Um, or is this a great new way to enjoy ice cream in, in Central Square, but maybe you don't get to do that if you're in Upham's Corner. And then as we think about starting to welcome people into public, starting to really think about inclusive public making, what are some ways that we, some things that we've learned along the way and with all of the um, mistakes that we've made and things that we've learned and things that have gone well and poorly, um, 
how do we do our planning? How do we start that public making from the beginning with different opinions, different ideas? How are we including local merchants, residents? How are we making sure that youth are there? How are we making sure that we're including new populations in our town or immigrant communities in our cities and towns? Um, so thinking about being inclusive from the start, thinking about it. We don't create a whole event that came out of one organization or one town planning office and then invite people and hope that they come, right? We really engage people in that design. Um, we create opportunities for co-creation in real time. It's not that you had to know about it ahead of time or get on some planning committee. You could get to an event and help make it happen. You could actually be a part of making it vibrant and making it better. Um, we think about inclusive outreach, right? Not just making sure things are bilingual or multilingual, but also where are they? Are they in barbershops? Are they on poles in a neighborhood? Are they just online? Are they on a, a local Spanish radio station, right? How are they getting out to the communities that you wanna have feel welcome? Um, one of the things that we talk about also is mixing the familiar with the strange. There's familiar things that call us to a space, um, familiar music or smells, tastes, you know, a vendor that we love, um, a game that we love, an activity that we might do together. But also when we create spaces that are, that are new and strange, uh, something that people might not have seen before, it creates a level playing field. It's a new space that might create new ways of being together because we've never been in uh, a public kitchen together or a social emergency response center together. Those are a couple examples that the studio did. But as you think about things, really creating new terrain can be a lot of fun as well. Um, we talk about mixing scale, size, and duration, right? So really overlapping opportunities for big public festivals, right? Like I might maybe they happen once a year, but also are there things that are happening every Friday? Are there things that are happening every month? Things that bring people together and start to build the communities that can then be involved in the, in the annual festivals. And then also thinking um, about design for all and universal design. When we design spaces that work for folks across abilities, across cultures, across ages, and across languages, it works better for everybody. It's not just that, oh, we have this great event planned and now we have to think about um, folks with physical disabilities or elders or folks with um, different languages, but really thinking about a design that works for everybody. Um, I say this sometimes when I'm working with folks who are used to planning meetings and having childcare. Childcare is really important for families to come to a meeting, but sometimes we can actually do better than that. We can design a meeting that includes and values our young people, right? We don't have to put them somewhere else. We might actually design something, and this was really important to us when we did the Social Emergency Response Center, designing a space where all of us were together thinking about what we were experiencing. So that design for all really created a space that gave us new ideas and sometimes better ideas than if we had said, okay, there's childcare over there. On that note, I want to welcome our um, panelists. We're going to get to hear from a couple of really experienced and fabulous um, panelists. I want to uh, introduce Roberto first, and then I'll get a chance to introduce Karen. Um, Roberto Bedoya is um, a longtime voice in the creative placemaking field. He's currently the cultural affairs manager for the city of Oakland. And uh, he actually, <laughs> got to give him a lot of props for this. He shepherded the city's cultural plan, Belonging in Oakland, the cultural development plan, and it's amazing. Um, but he is also a phenomenal writer. If you are interested in reading his essay about creative placemaking and the politics of belonging and disbelonging really shaped a lot of our work around creative placemaking. His ideas about the aesthetics of belonging are really amazing. Um, spatial justice and the rust classification, race and city, also something I really enjoyed. So many other things to learn from him, but I'm gonna stop that and let him speak himself. And I'll stop sharing here so you can see him. Roberto, you are muted. Okie doke. Uh, how do I look? I don't, okay, very good. You Thank great. you. Um, where do I begin? You know, it's sort of like Lori, I have great respect for Lori and, and, and Kenny and what they're doing. And so they called me up and said, would you want to be part of this conversation? I said, of course, anything. And then, you know, uh, so I want to give a thanks out, shout out to Lori, uh, also the Design School for Social Innovation, NIFA and the Metropolitan Area Planning Group and my colleague, 
my co-speaker, Karen. So this notion of who's public, planning and placemaking in the, for welcoming public spaces. So I, I guess that I get invited because I'm the placemaking dude. And I'm supposed to get, I get a lot of invitations to talk about that. And my thoughts about placemaking are constantly sort of emerging and evolving as times change. Uh, and we live in interesting times. Uh, and, and it's an interesting prompt of making it public, activating public space for creative connections and celebration to speak about. Yet, I mean, this is being real. We live in COVID-19. We live in a contracted economy. We live with this amplified calls for equity and the work of realizing what it means to be in a just city, which is all these things that I'm currently wrestling with. So I wrote something and then I woke up last night, like about three and I said, oh shit, I don't like that. I'm gonna park it. I'm going to read a little bit of something that I wrote most recently about creative placemaking because I wrote this article about creative placemaking, the politics of belonging and this belonging a number of years ago. Somebody asked me to reflect on that. And I thought, well, that's some fresh writing on me. And then I'm gonna kind of read a little bit of that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the notion, and this hasn't been formally developed, but it's an evolving thought and I'm eager to hear your response to it, uh, the notion of civic trauma. Because we are living in a time of civic trauma. Uh, so, let me just start off. So this, the, sub, this, the subtext for the remarks is creativity, connection, and celebration. And it's sort of funny to think about all the joys that are associated with creativity, connection, and celebration in this very stressful time. So we, before we, so my last comment on that, seeing all you guys and gals on this, give me joy. So my my remarks here um so i wrote this essay and so i'm going to read these comments here in 19 19 boy am i old in 2013 when i wrote creative place making and the politics of belonging and disbelonging i ended that essay with these words and questions quote let us reflect upon the work of creative place making and it asks if this activity is engaged in the politics of belonging or disbelonging. Does it suck out creative life or support it? Is it ethical and just? And let's answer these questions, be central to our own self-reflection and discussions of impact of outcomes of success and failure in the work being done. That was a question I asked myself in 23. To answer my own questions, at this moment of Black Lives Matters, COVID-19, our contracted economy, the calls for equity, and the work of realizing a just city associated with creative placemaking practices, or to use the public making practices, is in some ways to give voice to frustration and let down. The miscarriage of the field of creative placemaking, and yes, it's now a field of practice and you can get a, a degree in it, from its start is a failure to articulate whether it was a property rights or a human rights movement that shaped its practices and policies. Further, further to this point, embedded in property rights and human rights are the politics of belonging and disbelonging. I've, I've been surprised by how my critique and the concept, concept of belonging as central to placemaking practice has become a sticky word for many who are engaged with community, cultural development, and arts-based civic engagement projects. I mean, I think I, the property rights, human rights uh, kind of frame is really important for us to be mindful as we're in this moment of sort of reflecting on public and publicness. Um, as a policy maker in this field, I have an understanding that before you have places of belonging and you must feel you belong, that the built environment of mixed use structures 
or space shuttles operate inside the field of a planning planet, which is okay, but it's not enough. If creative place making or city place making or public public make public making ignores justice and social justice that enlivens place. In the early days of this developing field, I was often asked why aren't more folks of color a part of this under, undertaking? After some reflection and fatigue with this question, I stated that the problem of creative placemaking is its complicity with the white racial imaginary that, that frames um, people of color as property without human rights, evident in the practices of disbelonging, gentrification, and the white savior industrial complex strategies and cultural practices. Yet as a civic enterprise, Creative Places is not a total failure. In recent years, it has moved beyond the cage, its cage as, a, as Creative place, place making as a property rights movement through its investment and community cultural development. It needs to move down this path with more intention and lift up arts-based civic engagement projects as a manifestation of creative place making. It's, it often reflect on the governance systems embedded in creative place making. And uh, you know, every time I use the word creative place making, I also want us to think about public making. So reflect on the governance systems embedded in creative place making, public making, uh, and that stakeholder community the real estate developer, the city manager, the artist, the city planner, the elected officials, the foundation program officer, the neighborhood spokesman, the housing right activists, who has agencies in this entanglement. As a counterframe to creative place making, I use the curve creative place keeping. How does the neighborhood keeping the stories of a place alive, by keeping a beloved landmark, by keeping the rent. I think about the poetics of creative placemaking, creative keeping, and affect. For example, how sounds. We have New Orleans blues, Chicago blues, or Oakland blues. And they identify a place and articulate the aesthetic speech of a locale? How does one feed the desires for, to connect to land, neighborhood, home, of being in and of place? As for investments in place-making practices, public-making practices that engage with justice of the plural and belonging that sustain and community and animate civic lives. So that's what I said almost a decade later, still I'm of my final civic Roberto, we're losing your context, uh, video. Oh. Maybe if you turn your video off, we could at least hear you better because we want to hear what you have to say. Okay, I don't know what's going on. I'll just, you listen to me. You don't need to see my face. So in the Thanks. context of uh, civic, civic trauma, I want to put where this term sort of came in the foreground of my life. Uh, when the ghost ship fire happened here in Oakland and there was a loss of those lives, uh, I recall being in a conversation with the uh, novelist uh, uh, Tommy Orange, who wrote this great book called There, There, and the mayor, Levy Schaff, and we were talking about, and Tommy asked the mayor, like, what's the hard part of your job? And she said, it's holding civic trauma. So as a civic body, you know, like the death of number of youth, youth or in the, a pandemic, we often, we don't think about civic trauma. And I've witnessed many cultural practices 
that are so grounded in the story of telling my trauma of otherness. I've been raped, I've been I'm demonized because I'm queer, I'm a, I'm a victim of abuse, I'm a victim of the prison systems. And so that's, one, that's really important. But how do you move from the I to the we? What is, think about the civic body and the traumas it faces and how do we move the dial that way if we're engaged with public and publicness. So in some ways, to me, if I'm supposed to be given the charge of being the operational, uh, of being the manager here in Oakland, it's like, how do I, and creating a culture plan called, you know, belonging in Oakland, how do I operationalize belonging? And in some ways that involves system change. How do you invest in system change? And then on top of that, there was this wonderful scholar named Patricia Reed. I think she's in Philly. I don't know where she's at, but she used this term, the promiscuous public. And we know that public is a promiscuous space. All you have to do is go to farmer's markets. You have to go to Chinatown. You have to go to festival culture. Everybody's very fluid. And there's a way in which policy, which aims to fix so often, doesn't know how to deal with culture, which is very fluid. So how do you kind of work with this notion of the public is promiscuous. It's going to be moving around like it does. And so I think for me, my strategy has, has to go, brings me back to the term belonging and in a funny kind of way to kind of critique my, 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 I guess it's industry, my, my association with the arts management. Um, there is this language around scale that's often caged in the notion that we're supposed to scale up. We're supposed to get bigger and brighter and have more resources. But nobody talks about scaling out. And what this community cultural development is about scaling out belonging and how as a municipal agency, how do we enable scaling out, especially this really profound charge that we have. How do we scale out belonging in a time of social distancing? As it gets worse and we see more collapse of all the social networks that kind of bind us together. And part of it is, is to finally, the final thought is to embrace an understanding of the pronoun we, not as, uh, a definition of me and my friends, or which can be kind of like a privatized version of we that that Apple may bark about. We are Apple, or but understand it as a, a secular space that includes people you don't know. And how do you live in that we? And how do you prompt that we? And how do you support that we? Um, so I'll just. And my remarks there, and sorry you couldn't see me, but I, I'm going to come on for a second. But I talk this way a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto. All right. Thank you so much. I'm really, uh, now I'm thinking about the promiscuous public and looking forward to getting back to a promiscuous public that's more fluid than what we have now. Um, and I want to uh, share some examples um, from that with our next panelist and artist, Karen Young. Uh, I've known Karen for a long time and really reconnected with her when we were doing the Social Emergency Response Center. And I thought, you know, folks really need to bang a drum right now. We really need to bang a drum. And I said, I know someone who's got some big drums. And uh, Karen was actually a, a real pioneer coming out of the circ in terms of thinking about Tycho drumming as an interactive collective healing activity. So I went right to her and said, Karen, we need you on this panel. Um, she is not only a Tycho drummer, but a cultural organizer and artist, really inter interested at those intersections of art, grassroots organizing, and policy that a lot of us are interested in. Um, currently, she's a Boston Neighborhood Fellow with the Boston Foundation. Um, she is the founding director of the Genki Spark, as well as um, the co-founder and producer of the Blossom 
of the Brookline Cherry Blossom Festival, which we'll get to see a little bit of, and a former Boston artist in residence. Um, so uh, let me welcome Karen Young. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. Um, it's really great to be here. I appreciate those of you who have your screens on. It's nice to talk to some folks. It's great to see some familiar faces. Um, it's really interesting to be on Zoom these days um, as a performing artist, as a taiko drummer, um, as many of us are trying to figure out how to do our work um, in this new setting. Um, I um, Spatial justice and the idea of taking space is really one of the things that's core of my work. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with taiko drumming, it's an art form that um, originates in Japan. Um, it's been in the United States for um, over 60 years now as a Japanese American, Asian American art form. Um, and I've been um, playing and performing for about, uh, I guess, 20, over 20 years at this point. But my real roots are in organizing. Um, uh, I started out as a youth organizer, um, started a project called Youth on Board, which was really looking at how young people can take space with adults making decisions that impact them. Um, working with uh, like Boston Public Schools, thinking about how young people can actually be at the heart and center of creating um, culture there and uh, developing, you know, school proposals. Um, my art was kind of a, uh, a secondary life um, for a long time. Um, and I decided, actually, when I turned 40, I was like, how do I actually make this be the center? Because for me, um, Taiko drumming was something that really let, opened a door to my identity and really exploring sort of who I was um, uh, and really gave me some real um, mm, openings to my family history, um, being both Chinese and Japanese. So for me, you know, Taiko was not just an art form that I kind of learned to, because I like to play the drum, it really became a, um, a window into understanding myself and my place, um, particularly in this country. Um, being fifth generation Chinese American and third generation Japanese American, there's a long lineage that was not communicated to me um, by my family, mostly out of um, uh, a need to kind of hide um, uh, and endure, you know, racism and um, handle the world. Um, so for me, um, something really exciting happens when you take a 16 inch stick and you decide you're going to strike a drum. Um, I like to explore where um, the art form of Taiko can really um, open up conversations about power and identity and um, the idea of taking space and making space. Um, this has been something that's been really exciting to me because in order to play, you actually need to use your whole body and use, uh, commit yourself. Um, you can't when you hit the drum and everyone else hasn't hit the drum, they all see you. So <laughs> the idea of like claiming that space, um, being okay with making mistakes, being um, out of sync, those are all things that are very interesting to me. And so when I was, um, I was selected to be a Boston artist in residence in um, 2018 by the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, I was thrilled beyond belief to be able to combine my love of um, organizing and art uh, on behalf of the city. And my partners um, uh, were the Boston Center for Youth and Families uh, Grove Hall Senior Center. Uh, you know, having organized um, primarily in the Asian community and particularly with Asian women with the Genki Spark, I was really ready to really get behind and think about how um, the, the processes and um, the art form that I had really uh, used as a way to uplift Asian women could be used to be to really uplift and think about bolstering elders um, and their concerns. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Older and Boulder, um, which is a project that really came to life out of that year that I spent and has continued for the last three years. Um, so uh, in the last nine years, one of the events that was really has been near and dear to my heart is the Brookline Cherry Blossom Festival. Um, it takes place in Brookline in partnership with the Brookline High Japanese program. I uh, wanted to see not only how Taiko and my art could really bolster elders 
particularly black and brown elders in Grove Hall Senior Center, but how it could be potentially used as a way to create relationships and um, a place for um, the Asian community that I was really rooted in and really rooted in and um, the black and brown community in Boston. So I'm just gonna start off by showing just a little video clip here um, of what happens um, in my first few months after um, teaching elders Taiko um, and inviting them to perform at the Cherry Blossom Festival. So um, this festival um, took quite a bit to have people feel comfortable. Um, I had asked the city if we could rent a 50 passenger bus for um, elders and their families. And they said, yes, it was the first time um, the Cherry Blossom Festival had had such a uh, presence of uh, um, black and brown families. And this is a little bit of what happened. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that little clip. I, uh, <laughs> thanks for the little waves. Um, you know, older and bolder um, in all its elements was uh, the main thing I was thinking about the entire time is how do we really make young, how do we really create an opportunity for them to be in the center? Um, and as I said, that festival has been going on, has been going on, obviously not this year, um, for nine years and was most of the labor is um, artists and high school students. And so when I um, proposed the idea of having Older and Boulder come, you know, one of the big questions we asked ourselves was like, how do we create a welcoming space for them? Um, how knowing that this is a, a, a new and unique opportunity so we had VIP tables set up and we had a welcoming committee um, that was uh, uh, set, set up to really um, make sure that every single person was welcomed personally. Um, but also as an artist, I made sure that, you know, there were several orientation sessions so that they could learn the foods and they could learn the dances and learn chopsticks and basic things like that, that sometimes we just take for granted putting somebody in a new place that they're just going to figure it out. Um, and a lot of that work was really based on relationships. And so, again, and Laurie, I think you have to wave if I'm out of time. Um, but um, a lot of that, uh, that opportunity, as you can see, just created such an excitement and enthusiasm um, for each other and themselves and for connection and for community and unity um, that it led very quickly and easily into thinking about um, Civic, um, civic practice and thinking about policy because that was something that was really core to this uh, residency. And so um, one of the issues that really emerged quickly was thinking about, um, thinking about street safety. Um, and I'm just gonna share a couple slides here because Lori hasn't waved at me yet. Um, 
And sort of given this new joy, this new enthusiasm, this new excitement, one question came up was, you know, what is the best and hardest thing about being older, being an elder in the city? Um, and what issues concern you and what can we do about it? And so organizing um, became uh, a key element of this, of this um, residency and um, addressing a uh, unsafe crosswalk uh, right outside the senior center was something that needed to be looked at. And in partnership with the city in many different ways, um, Age Strong Commission, the Boston Transportation Department, uh, Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, of course, um, BCYF, Walk Boston, Movable Streets all came together to rally and organize. And so the result of that uh, became um, elders really being engaged in community meetings, talking about street safety. Okay. And that crosswalk was then modified. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That was awesome. I love the video. Um, so I don't want to miss that point, even though it got a little short at the end, like the things that come out of public making, right? Coming out of a chance for, for elders to take over a space and be loud and be powerful. And then in, in a circuitous way, ending up actually using that power to make themselves more safe and becoming advocates for themselves and other folks in the sense that if you make a crosswalk that is safe for elders across the street to their very community center that they go to, it's also safer for everybody else. So thanks so much. Um, we, uh, we want to give you all a chance to talk amongst yourselves, um, but I think Emma's got a couple of things to review as we put you in some small groups and then bring you back to, uh, to talk to the panelists. Yes, thank you, Lori. And thank you again, Roberto and Karen. Uh, for your wonderful presentations and remarks. Um, so very quickly, I know that not everyone may be able to stay for the next portion of the event since we'll be moving into small group conversations and then back together for a Q&A. So if you need to leave, we very much understand and we'll be sharing out resources in a follow-up email after this event as well as the recording. Um, but for those of you who you know, can stick around, I wanted to share a couple of really quick announcements um, just so that there are some ways for you to stay connected with our organizations. We have also some opportunities we wanted to let you know about. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Thank you for bearing with me. So, um, the first quick announcement is just that, um, as I mentioned, when we came together, uh, MAPC is in the midst of updating our uh, regional plan, uh, Metro Common 2050. Okay. And as part of that, we're um, hosting a series of workshops focused on different topic areas within the plan, such as equity of wealth and health and inclusive mobility. Um, but we're also seeking participants for a short documentary film that will feature residents of Boston um, this film is called Living Together, and it will highlight the experiences of people in the region um, and connect those into our plan and planning process. And so we just wanted to let you all know and invite you to, um, if you're interested in uh, actually being a participant in the film, um, we have a call for participants out now, and you can see that in the URL that is on this slide. Uh, Lori. Yeah, very quickly, um, excited to hear uh, what comes out of your small groups and a chance to talk to each other, but also for, for another time, a really interesting new resource on our website, Spatial Justice 2.0, with a lot of different um, thinkers, cultural workers, and artists thinking about spatial justice. So feel free to check that out later. Thanks. Awesome. And I'll just take a minute to introduce our two new grant opportunities. Um, Collective Imagination for Spatial Justice supports teams of artists, creatives, culture bearers, cultural organizers, and community-based collaborators to do this important work of imagining public art that fosters and contributes to more just futures and more, um, more just futures in public spaces. Um, thinking about older and bolder, um, how do you, I, I'm imagining Karen took some time to, to dream up older and bolder. And so this, this is the type of grant that would help support dreaming up um, a project like Older and Boulder. We don't expect artists to do this work of imagination 
alone. Um, and at NEFA, we also believe that the role of artists is to contribute to more just public making and social change. Um, so we hope that these grants uh, support and honor the necessary time and, and space um, that's needed to do the work of imagination before you go into planning and creating and, and implementing public art. Um, you can learn more at the URL there. And yeah, our second opportunity is Public Art for Spatial Justice, which supports Massachusetts artists and artistic collaborations to create public art in Massachusetts that fosters public imagination and contributes to more just futures for our public spaces and public culture. So we wanna support public art that's breathing spatial justice into our public spaces. And you can learn more at uh, www.nefa.org, create spatial justice. All right, thanks all. So um, Emma, you wanna share your screen with the uh, questions for the small groups and we will start to break folks up. Um, it's really a highlight to get to actually talk to a few folks instead of just listen. So we're gonna give you a chance to turn on your video, turn on your mics, talk to each other. Um, we're gonna invite you first just to go around, you know, be humans, tell each other who you are, where you are, what you do, why you're here. Um, but also something you heard from the panel, from any of us that inspired you to think about something in your own context around spatial justice and public making and this really important time to be welcoming folks. Um, and then if you have time also to think about some questions, some ways that uh, your conversation that we weren't all a part of um, made you think about the panel and maybe some questions you have coming back um, that came out of your conversations and what you learned from each other. So just a chance to share and kind of dig into the content together um, dig into thinking about how you might use it and what other questions you have. Um, we're running a little behind schedule, so I would say probably 15 minutes um, in our small groups, and then we'll come back and get a chance to ask some of those questions of uh, Karen, myself, and Roberto. So we'll see you soon. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I apologize if you were very abruptly Zoom zapped out of your conversation. Um, we're just waiting for folks to trickle in. It looks like people are coming back. All right. Hi, welcome back. Welcome, love to uh, welcome everybody back. Um, hear a little bit about the questions that came up for you all in your small groups. We have Karen and Roberto here ready to go as well as myself. You might have your own questions or just something that you heard that really struck you that you want to share with everybody or that you want to ask us to kind of dig into with you. Um, we can share by um, waving your hand at the screen or waving your digital hand since we have multiple screens. Um, definitely feel free to add your question in the chat box and if my uh, co-hosts uh, co at MAPC and NEPA want to shout things out. Uh, Tia has raised their hand. Let's see. Tia, do you want to unmute yourself? Tia, can we hear your question? Tia, we still can't hear you. All right, if somebody else uh, wants to jump in with a question, Tia, we'd love to hear you when you have a chance to unmute yourself. Aaron has a question. Aaron, do you want to uh, unmute yourself? Hey, did I? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, Miyoshi and myself, we were contemplating sort of the connection between creative placemaking and the evolution towards public making and wondering because I, um, I studied creative placemaking and I've always been a little challenged by that um, term because there was a place that existed already 
And so I'm wondering about that. That's a great question. Um, yeah, we were involved with doing creative placemaking here along the Fairmount Cultural Corridor in Boston and always found it a strange term. In fact, Roberto, uh, his early writing for one of the ways that I kind of got my head around it because I was like, placemaking, but there's so much going on here. There's so much vibrancy and diversity in public life. Um, and I think we have seen also in some ways how creative placemaking has veered away from actually celebrating what's local and what's site specific and who lives here and who's trying to thrive here into a notion of sort of a generic, like there's umbrellas and beanbags, it's so fun. Um, there's food trucks uh, and that sort of creative placemaking to us feels more corporate. Um, it feels like, oh, look, now you can play cornhole at City Hall. Well, that's cool, but that, that's not cool for everybody. And it's not necessarily um, speaking to what it could speak to in terms of the diversity of Boston. So. Um, place making and public making we felt like we started to think about public making in terms of just really thinking about our public life and really engaging people and inviting people um, one of my colleagues here on the call uh, Melissa if she hasn't had to get off she um, talks about radical welcoming and radical welcoming as a part of public making has always been really important right really um, saying not only will we do something here, but we'll make sure that you're being welcomed. Specifically, you, Aaron, if you came to an event, right, we'd say, hi, we're glad you're here. Um, folks would look like you. We'd have young people out welcoming folks and elders and folks who spoke different languages. So I think um, that was part of as we were getting to thinking about how, well, how do we bring people together in a way that can forward spatial justice. Yes. Thank uh, you. And I think Tia is, is with us now. Tia, are we still failing to unmute you or? Uh, let me uh, grab a question out of the chat while we, we hope to get Tia back. Um, Ron said, what placemaking does is allow people to avoid gaining knowledge about a place. That does go on here, what has gone on here, and having that knowledge embedded in whatever new ideas might show up, activating the imagination to in fact bring people together. Um, Ron, you might need to say a little bit more about that. Uh, or maybe we can. Uh... Let me let me respond to that. Thank you, Roberto. No, you know, I mean, I've written about this, you know, I, I don't damn creative placemaking, but you know, it really came from the field of planners and, and real estate developers. They, they, they claimed um, kind of ownership of those terms and when it got among community-based folks, it was it was a different articulation. And um, when the economy going sour and real estate going bust, it's it's a perfect time to abandon that term <laughs> and and take up some other ones. I think among the activist community that I was aware of, uh, the first counterframe that I encountered from and I wrote about to create a place where it was create a place keeping which sort of uh, acknowledged the agency among the people that lived in um, a locale. And then among some, I've, I do some work in Arizona, I've done some work uh, with some indigenous uh, planners and scholars who are now using the term place snowing. And so in some ways, it just sort of grounds agency in the locale, in the grant the ground, excuse me, the ground. Or, you know, I was talking to um, Teresa, or excuse me, Rebecca, who works on the waterfront. People know the waterfront. What does place knowing look like? And what does that mean like? And how do you create access to water, the waterfront? That's a policy discussion, but that's place knowing, uh, as opposed to, you know, turning the warehouse into a, a super duper gourmet market, which is, you know, what happens often. Thank you, Roberto. I want to um, grab this question, just just uh, hear from the chat as well, and, and turn this to our, to our panelists, as well as to others. Um, can we utilize this framework to challenge municipal structures that are already in place? 
What framework? <laughs> I believe the framework of public making. I'm a public servant. It's my job to always make the argument for the public. Uh, you know, and I think, you know, Cara there in, in your city is wonderful. Uh, and, you know, it's just sort of feeling that you have agency. How do you create agency? Um, you know, and I guess that's to me is a grassroots community-based activity. Uh, I'm lucky I have a, I live in a, a city that's pretty animated and I have a healthy dysfunctional government, uh, meaning that the bureaucracies are just kind of daunting, but people bark and people listen. Yep. I, you know, I know when I think about like how to bolster elders, I was thinking about how do we make them undeniable, like bright neon colors, big loud sounds you can't ignore. How do we create a situation where you cannot be ignored? Um, yeah, this comes to um, I also think about Roberta's um, use of the word civic self-esteem and our awareness that some folks have a lot of self civic self-esteem and some folks don't. And I think about it as we're doing some um, planning for Franklin Park because it borders different communities, uh, a largely white community in Jamaica, Jamaica Plain and largely communities of color in Dorchester and Roxbury. And boy, those of us in Jamaica Plain, we just come right out to those meetings. We are out there, we're in forest, we got things to say about our dogs or the grass or the, you know. So I think that public making and these opportunities to be together in public also increase the relationships that then can create a different dynamic, can force a, you know, a meeting that's not public enough to actually be in public, be in the park, or to share the knowledge that this meeting is happening to make sure that our neighbors and colleagues that we met out in public are there and are heard. Um, because I think there are ways that our city meetings, our planning meetings are very traditional. You have to know about them. You have to get there. So how do we kind of use public making to turn them inside out? to make those meetings be outside or to make, if the meeting is still inside, to make the content that is involved in the meeting something that we got from outside, from talking to people on the street or from being in community uh, with them. I also think, Lori, about like the Cirque and how like attractive and joyful, like when you center on joy and ex you ex center on kind of, um, you know, it it's becomes attractive you know and and it's like magnetic you know people want to be there they want to come out they want to connect um and uh touching on that i want to bring up this question um how do you create a sense of belonging in times of covid could the panelists provide examples on how to engage people and how do we step out of our usual social groups maybe we're always even more defined by our social groups now that we're um on zoom um, so some examples of, of doing this in this current time or using this current time to actually prepare for this. Uh, you know, here we have a, we have a, a platform, a fundraise. We have a funding opportunity uh, called Neighborhood Voice. And it, it's always been about how to scale out belonging, like I mentioned earlier, and it involves artists working with an, an NGO to do uh, community-based problem solving art around cultural policies, around some cultural issues. That's one way um, we're, you know, obviously, you know, I'm also involved in another project with two other uh, local foundations to um, support projects that deal very forthrightly with the topic of a just city. So what does that mean? So I, I just, you know, obviously I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm a, I work in the field of culture and I look at artist projects as ways to build um, um, social connections and social cohesion. But I think my alarm is that we're not gonna get back to normal uh, anytime soon and what the, new normal will be, will be in many ways um, connected to building social networks. In my government, you know, I, I'm lucky in the sense, but I'll just use this as an example. Uh, my arts and cultural revenue stream is, is 
tied to the bed tax, not exclusively, hotel tax. That's gone. And like the, in municipalities across the country who get their revenues, not from the general fund, from a, 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 an emissions tax or a bed tax, they're gonna to be totally stressed out. So, you know, I just know what's coming down the pike. So people are gonna be, the pain is gonna be, is gonna be a little more amplified. Um, and so that goes to my reflections and thoughts about civic trauma. We've got to collectively figure out civic trauma. So I work in partnership with the Department of Transportation and the Department of Planning and on various projects and really how do we build up civic life? And I would love to add that there are also, I mean, I think when we think about civic life and we think about how do we create spaces of belonging to acknowledge how many artists and community groups have done amazing work online. And so as we head back to being in public together, not letting go of some of the advantages of um, that folks can be together across the world, right? We've had concerts and performances where we've gotten to join from across the world. We've had community events where we've gotten to, to eat together and be together. And so as we think about coming back together, not to say, hey, now if you aren't physically able to get to the space, sorry, that was then, but like, how do we bring some of the relationships that we've built online and bring some of the advantages of being able to connect across the world um, into our new spaces? Um, because there are ways that we have actually um, connected, you know, I think about some of the, the queer youth that don't have access to queer youth spaces because they're not in big cities and how they've connected with others um, across the world and across the country, right? So thinking about our, our we, our collective we sometimes isn't proximate, it's, it's in different ways. So continuing to, to hold up those examples. Um, we do yeah. have more questions coming in and I think we have a hand raised, uh, Michelle. Your hand has been up for a while, so let's let's hear from Michelle, and then I'll hand it over to Emma to see if we have time for any other questions or if we need to wrap up. Michelle. Hello, can you hear me? I can, we can. Great, how is everyone? Um, first of all, it's a great blessing to be a part of this group of amazing people and, and creators of space. Um, one of the things that I am struggling with uh, in this COVID era that we're in is um, the lack of contact that we are, are, are living right now. One of the things that I did when I had, I had a long standing open mic out in Lynn. And one of the things that I made it a point to do at all my open mics was give a hug to everybody in the room. Because a lot of people, and I think a few of the, of the people in this, in, this, in this Zoom have touched upon that. There's way too many people that feel like they don't belong there's way too many people that feel already awkward in certain spaces. In a sense, this whole, um, this whole COVID era has opened up opportunities for people that, you know, perhaps suffered from certain types of anxieties and things like that to experience the arts world from, from a more safe perspective, I guess, if you will. Um, but how, how can we take spaces like I think it was Mr. Roberto that mentioned uh, like something like the, the the coastal line like the seashore we have great beaches in Massachusetts all over Massachusetts and what greater place to to have you know even if it's smaller type of of, of displays of art and, and 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 I don't even know if we could say gatherings at this point but there are so many places that we can explore um but one, another thing that we, we've mentioned in this group is how, you know, there's boards and committees and, and uh, on a political, you know, governmental level, um, statewide, citywide, that kind of control these things. So how can we have more of a say in, in, in how these things are, are handled and, and, and held available to the public? Like, our beaches got shut down for months during the first part of COVID. So like, how, how can they even have the right to do things like that? And how limited are we as both artists and holders of space to create something like an open mic? Like how could we do an open mic in this era and still keep the genuine feel of it um, and not lose any, 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 any connection, 
if you will. I I don't know how to express. It. This is such a difficult time to to be a creative soul, you know. Um, but there there's so many so many opportunities now. Um, I feel like if we could create like a, a, a small smaller type of enclosures in these public spaces, like maybe we could have like a tent or a little hut that we could put up at, at, at some of the beaches and have people do like on location type things that would not be like open to everybody and a little bit more protected. I don't know. I have lots of ideas, but my question is how could we be more empowered to have a little bit more control over these public spaces because as public as they are, we don't have a lot of access to them unless we rent and rave. Thank you, Michelle. And I think that's a, a, a perfect close because what you're, what you're closing us with is the fact that we have so many ideas, right? And yet we're also struggling, right? We all also are in this really strange time and you're able to point out some of the things that have been beautiful about it and that artists have brought to it, but also, right, some of the ways that we don't feel like we have control and we don't feel like we have community around us. And uh, so already starting on, on some cool examples and I would love to, love to have more time to hear other folks, things that you've tried as well as, you know, things that you're wondering about. Um, we're getting close to the end, so I do want to invite Karen and Roberto if there's anything else that you want to shout out or any other question that you've seen in the chat that you haven't had a chance to get to. Um, and then we will uh, wrap it up. Yeah. I, um, you know, as a performing artist, I, I feel you, Michelle. Um, I feel like, you know, and Laura, you spoke to it, like we are struggling and we're trying to figure out new ways to create community. Um, and I've seen a lot of, as you said, in really interesting, exciting things happen on Zoom. Um, where we've been able to create together um, and there's been really great examples of people like working over time creating things together and creating intimate spaces um, but obviously that's no substitute for being out you know up close hugging um, so I look forward to really seeing sort of what comes out um, with other artists I know a lot of artists are trying to think about this right now or right in this moment um, so I'm right on this call I see so uh, thank you for, you know, having this conversation and I look forward to what's next. Uh, and thank you all, Lori and uh, Karen and everybody on the, the Zoom world. Um, a couple of things I want to say, um, and I was looking um, at the questions. I want to make somebody, a, a couple, couple, two things. I, when I talk about belonging in the civic context, I am really, I am not a shrink. I cannot, so I talk about the sociology of belonging more than the psychology of belonging. They are related, but as a public servant, I just need to sort of look at those systems that are employed to uh, disbelong. And there, that includes structural races, it, it includes a whole host of uh, challenges that we all face of have and have not in terms of resources. But I think ultimately at the end of the day, going to publicness, public, and I love the note, is from, from my shop and from my position in my career, it's about, it's like, how do you uh, create agency? How do you animate the public? Uh, how do you deal with the politics uh, that are alive, that are civic life? One last story, then I'll close out. When I did the cultural plan, there was this, and I ended up telling the story to the mayor about, like, what do we, what did I learn? I said, well, Oakland is the home of the Black Panther. We're really good with the clenched fist. You know, that is just like, uh, part of who we are. And that the, there is a job that artists and arts administrators and public people are often doing is the arm wrestle, you know, around policy kind of outcomes that you may want. And supposedly at the end of the day, there's supposed to be a handshake. And, and she looked at me, she goes, Roberto, that's pretty good, but you forgot something. And what? The sucker punch. So, <laughs> In some ways, COVID-19 is our sucker punch. And we, as we try to figure out 
how do we create uh, relationships in this time of social distancing? Thanks, Roberto. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, MAPC and NIFA. Um, am I handing it off to somebody else here? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it from here. Um, Thank you. Wow. COVID-19 is our sucker punch. I think that's <laughs> where we're ending today. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you all so much for joining us. Um, on behalf of NEPA, MAPC, and ds 4 I just want to say a big thank you to Lori and Karen and Roberto for sharing your inspiring examples of public making, as well as challenging us to maybe move beyond place making to place knowing and towards more collective understanding of we. Um, we've stretched our imaginations and helped us to think uh, a little bit about how spatial justice could play out in our communities. So big thank you. And our last discussion of this series is next Tuesday, September 1st, same time, same place, um, 2 p.m. 2 to 3.30 p.m. Um, and we're gonna be focusing on planning and designing public spaces for spatial justice. Um, Kenny will be coming back to moderate, uh, and our speakers are Joseph Kunkel from the Citizen, he's a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation and executive director of the S Sustainable Native Communities Collaborative. Um, and Jessica Villasnovas is the director of the Lawrence Free Public Library. Um, if you haven't registered yet, I believe Sasha's tossing it in the chat. Um, and last but not least, MAPC will be sending out a follow-up email with a post-event survey that we hope you'll all fill out, um, as well as resources that uh, may have appeared in the chat today. So thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope to see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Next week. <laughs>